Hi everyone, this is Melissa Keller, Director of Events and Project Management for Vineyard Worship. We release new music on the first Friday of every month. Cherry Blossoms is Vineyard Worship's long-awaited monthly single for April 2020. Written by worship leader and songwriter Andy Squires, Cherry Blossoms is a song of immense hope that has been an underground phenomenon since its release in 2015. Featuring the voice of Emmy-nominated artist Dana J, this powerful anthem is already finding a home in churches around the world. Well, I feel a warm wind blowing Melting all the sadness off of my soul And I smell the sweet cherry blossoms Pouring all the gladness into Cherry Blossoms and all of our monthly singles wherever you listen to music. Chronic anxiety is a very specific form of anxiety. It's not PTSD and it's not generalized anxiety disorder. Chronic anxiety shows up any time a human being doesn't get what they think they need that they don't really need. So chronic anxiety is generated as a response to a false need. We think we need something to survive and be okay, but we really don't. Anxiety, if you indulge it, only ever leads to more anxiety. And so what we need is the gospel of Jesus to literally displace and cast out our anxiety. And then the way I live by faith, because I think when we talk about living by faith, it, it feels so ambiguous. But living by faith for me is as simple as, am I going to believe my self-narrative or am I going to believe the gospel of Jesus? And they're almost always in competition with each other. And so you now have a decision to make. And for me, it's a daily decision. The Ferment. You're listening to The Ferment Podcast, conversations about worship and transformation. Today's guest is Steve Cuss. Steve is a pastor and the author of the book, Managing Leadership Anxiety, Yours and Theirs. This episode is brought to you by our friends at worshipteam.com. Worshipteam.com comes preloaded with over 12,000 songs, with new songs being added all the time. Hillsong, Bethel, Vineyard, Six Steps, Jesus Culture, just to name a few. Service building with Worship Team is a snap, and all the songs are completely legal and licensed. You can also find them on social media, Facebook at worshipteam.com, Twitter at worshipteam, Instagram at worshipteam underscore WT. Visit them at worshipteam.com for a free trial today. Complete worship planning with thousands of songs, easy interface, mobile apps, and legal rights for your church. All you need in one place, worshipteam.com. All right, everybody. Welcome to the Ferment Podcast. My name is Adam Russell. Of course, I'm the host, and I have a very special guest all the way over the internet in Colorado. Um, Steve Cuss is my guest this morning. Why don't you say hello, Steve? Hello, how are you guys? Oh man, so good to have you on the podcast. For those of you who do not know, 
Steve is a pastor. Um, he is a leadership mentor, but he's also an author. And I came across his book called Managing Leadership Anxiety. And I was telling Steve just a moment ago off air that I don't normally really read leadership books, but this one came across my desk and it is really good. And I took my staff through it and it has just been a source of wonderful dialogue, but then also like emotionally revealing conversations, which is really, really great. So I just, I can't recommend it enough. And as soon as I got a hold of it, I wanted Steve to come on the podcast. And so I'm glad you're here. Yeah. Glad to be with you, man. Yeah. Hey, um, I thought maybe we would uh, do this kind of the way we always do these Ferment podcasts. I'd love to begin just by knowing a little bit about you. Can you just tell us where you're from and what was your family like? And did you grow up in a household of faith? That kind of thing. Yeah, I grew up in Perth, Western Australia, West Coast. Uh, we're the most isolated city in the world. So a uh, city of about, when I grew up, probably about half a million people. Now it's probably about a million and a half. It's really exploded. And uh, did not grow up in a church family at all. Our whole extended family, like my immediate nuclear family, but also all our extended family. I, I would say some form of agnostic, skeptic, Definitely from a family that would say that any kind of religious devotion uh, shows a sign of weakness. Mm. And then anyone who's a Christian is obviously not very intelligent. That would be broadly the religious view of my family. Having said that, very loving family, very close family. Lots of great memories getting together as family. Most of my father's side are, are from farming background. So I spent a lot of my childhood on different relatives' farms, which was amazing. And then my mother's side comes from convict background. Her side of the family got started when a horse thief, actually a mule thief, I used to think it was a horse thief. We just learned recently he was a mule thief, which just made me lose all respect for him. That's hilarious. Um, yeah. Uh, a mule thief married a prostitute. They'd, they'd been sent to Australia from England. And uh, generations later, you know, we show up. So my sister, when she was a teenager, started going to church. A, a friend of hers from school, high school, invited her. They went to youth group. My sister came to Christ. And then a couple of years later, she led me to Christ. So I became a Christian when I was 14. And it was, it was like nothing to do with the church at all into fully involved in the church. Okay, so this is your older sister? Yeah, my older sister. She's three and a half years older than me. And to this day, we're the only believers in our family, in our extended family. Wow. Okay, so yeah. she just goes yeah. to youth group, gets touched by God, and then shares that with you, and you're instantly all the way in. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I, you know, people, people talk about how the term in the Bible being lost, if somebody's lost, how that's like a pejorative term. Uh, I would just say it's a very descriptive term, and that's how I felt. Like when the Bible talks about somebody who's lost and then found, I was a suburban kid. I'm a, I've got a pretty boring testimony. I never really gave my parents any trouble. I was a straight kid. I've never been drunk. I've never been high. Like I remember having one puff of a cigarette when I was eight and thinking, yeah, no, that's not for me. Yeah. So I just, I'm just a straight arrow suburban kid, but I did know I was lost. I was absolutely lost. And uh, yeah, Jesus found me and that was incredible news. My, my parents um, got pretty concerned when both of their kids suddenly became, I think, what they would describe as religious freaks. It's interesting, you know, when you're a teenager, you're full of angst and you're always trying to define yourself. So I was convinced that we were being persecuted for the sake of the gospel, you know? <laughs> now, yes, of course. Now that I'm a, yeah, now that I'm a parent, I, I would say my parents probably thought we joined a cult and were probably trying to protect us from, you know, as good parents. So fast forward all these years, my parents still are not followers of Jesus. My uncles, aunts, cousins, none of them. But uh, we've got a very close relationship. We talk a lot about it. It's interesting. For sure, I've been in the church now, you know, three and a half decades. And there's a lot of ways where I still kind of look at it like an outsider, probably because of my family of origin. Amazing. So when did you not just become a Christian, but when did things, I'm imagining, amplify for you so that you became a pastor, because that's a big step, yeah. you know, not just being a Christian, oh, yeah. but going all the way into the ministry and saying, this is what I want to do with my life. Yeah. Yeah. So I was about, I think I was 14 when I got baptized and uh, I was, I just turned 17 when I really felt the call of God to be in ministry. I'd graduated high school. I was in university to study, to become a vet, which is all I'd ever wanted to do in my life. 
uh, a rural farm that I'd, you know, I'd grown up on my uncle's farm and my great uncle's farms. And I just thought, well, what a life. And uh, I was six weeks into university and just absolutely miserable doing what I thought I was born to do and no happiness at all. And so I took the study break and just sat on the beach and prayed and really felt God saying, look, I'm calling you into the ministry and uh, let's have you, you know, shepherd people instead of animals. And, and I just remember saying to God, what, what am I going to tell my parents? Because they were still pretty cautious and suspicious about our church activity. And uh, it took me a week to find the courage to tell my mom and dad, I remember. And I, I, I remember sitting them down. It was like 1130 at night. They ran a small business and it was bookkeeping season. So they were doing a lot of hours at work. And like my mom would roll in at 11 p.m. and my dad would roll in at midnight or something. And I remember saying, I don't remember which one came home first. I just remember saying, look, there's something I need to tell you. And I've been afraid to tell you. Can you not go to bed? Can you wait till dad comes home or mom comes home? I don't remember the, the specifics, but they waited. And, and I said, uh, look, I know I'm in university to be a vet. I want to be a minister. And in Australia, a minister could be a politician, like a minister of parliament. Oh, yes. Or it could be a preacher. And really, at home, at least at that time, the worst thing you could do with your life is, is really be a lawyer, a used car salesperson, a politician, or a preacher. Those would be like the worst of the worst. Yeah, so, so none of the options were good. Not, no great option. My sister was a lawyer. Oh, okay, <laughs> and perfect. She is a lawyer perfect. to this day. Perfect. She's, she's a lawyer. She's got a strong sense of justice, and she does a lot of work among people uh, in need of a, a good lawyer. And um, and so my parents said, you know, what kind of minister do you have in mind? And I said, I want to be a minister of the gospel. I want to, I want to work for the church. And uh, it's still to this day is an amazing thing. And they, they gave me their blessing. They, they said, look, we think you'd be really good at that. You should do that. And everything flipped. Uh, they, they basically, my parents are all into commitment and integrity. They're, they're people of incredible integrity. And they basically said, if you're going to be a minister, you need to be at church all the time. So they just went from being highly suspicious to fully embracing. It was incredible. And what a beautiful, what a beautiful story. Incredible. Even to this day, like my, my mom and dad are not followers of Jesus, but they're very proud of me. They're always interested in what I'm doing. Uh, you know, what I do and what I believe doesn't necessarily make a lot of sense to them, but they're as parents, they're incredible. In fact, I'll just tell a quick story just to give you a sense of the quality of my family. I, I, I moved to America to do my theological study, which also had their blessing. Aussies are very adventurous, and my parents had traveled the world when they got married, and my sister traveled the world. So this is a, this is a thing we do. So I, I'm, I, I came home after being in America a couple of years with my college, um, doing theological college, and it was Christmas time, and we're all at my grandfather's house, my mom's dad. And there's, I don't know, 40 or 50 cousins and uncles and aunts at the house. And we're about to eat. And uh, my, my grandfather gets everyone's attention. And he says, all right, everybody, Steve's home from America. And he's going to give the family prayer before we eat. And I'm looking at my granddad. I'm like, family prayer? Like, we've, we have never in, our, in my life prayed as a family, ever. We don't, Amazing. We don't own, like, our family owns two Bibles, my sister's and mine. You know, that's it. Mm. And, uh, but that was my grandfather's way of saying to the whole room, um, he's with us and we're into what he's into. It was incredible. That's beautiful. I love that. So I, I, just one more question on this, and then maybe we'll, we'll talk a little bit about your book. I'm just listening to your story and wondering, number one, I'm assuming your parents have been to visit you here in the States. Yeah. And multiple times. Yeah. We okay, see each so, other, try to see each other every year. Okay. So when, when they come over, do they go to church on Sunday with you? Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah, what do they come to what, church? What do they think? I'm just so interested. Oh, it's interesting. So our church is designed for two populations, for followers of Christ who want to grow in their faith and for skeptics who want to have a safe environment to ask whatever they want. And so in, in a very real way, I'm just trying to reach my parents. And obviously, you know, the book gets pretty personal about how our own narrative informs our leadership, but that's it for me. And so we have designed a church where the worship leader, whoever's on stage, everyone communicating, like our worship leader, he's, he's amazing. His name's Jimmy. And actually, we now have a, a new worship leader named Mariah. And, you know, they both grew up in the church. They totally get the vision. So Jimmy will frequently, before we start worship, say something like, look, it might be weird to you that suddenly we all burst into song together. Here's what we're doing. You can participate or you can watch. Just, just that little yeah. 20 to 30 second explanation. And it's funny, you know, Adam, you mentioned Vineyard. I, I've actually coached some Vineyard leaders in how to invite skeptics in. 
And I remember one vineyard church saying to me, man, I wonder if we should stop doing our healings because we get into some pretty unusual things in our service. <laughs> I remember saying, oh man, that would be terrible that you'd actually stop healing. Mm -hmm. All you have to do is explain it. You know, all you have to do is say, hey, here's what's about to happen and you can participate or not. So my parents love it. We built a building for our church. We were a portable struggling church plant and we were able to raise money and build a building. My parents gave money to the building project. I love that. It's incredible. And then I they, so love that. Yeah, they wept. I toured them through the building and, and they were tearing up and I was tearing up. It was really emotional. And, you know, on the one hand, it's an incredible story of what God's doing. And what's also true is if I were like running a soccer league and I built a soccer stadium, same story. Like they're just looking for ways to be proud of their son as parents. But it is beautiful. I mean, considering, you know, I've given my life to something that my extended family generally thinks is nuts. It's, it's pretty amazing. Yeah. Steve, just hearing your story actually makes your book make a lot more sense for me. Yeah. You know, I mean, I'm, we're going to get into some of this, but just even, even ideas like differentiation, like hearing your story makes concepts like that that are in your book make so much more sense for me and just the way that you've maybe even embodied it. So I, I just want to say thanks for telling your story. Well, and I, I have to say my parents have also embodied it. Like I, I would hate for anyone to be listening to this story and not be hearing really how my family's remarkable. So I'll, I'll give you a quick example. I know we need to get to the book, but my parents for several years after I grew up in the city, they then retired and moved onto a farm, 500 acre farm, or what we like to call in Australia, a, a backyard, you know? And so my mom and dad got new neighbors and uh, they're just getting to know each other. And the neighbor asks my dad, oh, you know, do you have kids? Oh yeah, I've got a daughter and a son. Well, what does your daughter do? And, and my dad said, oh, she's a lawyer. Oh. oh, well, then what does your son do? Well, he's a, he's a preacher. Oh, and literally, my dad was telling me, he said, literally, this guy's looking at me like, what's wrong with you as a parent that your kids would soon out, turn out so terribly? And, and hearing my dad explaining to this guy, oh, you don't understand. Like the church that Steve's running, it's not like that. They're not only after your money and they're not idiots. They're very intelligent. You know, he has a PhD astrophysicist in his church. Like yeah. my dad is, that, I think that's a testament also to the power of differentiation that uh, my, my family of origin has also been able to overcome their own biases and the story they told themselves to, to stay connected. So yeah, that's, in order that's to, great too. In order to stay connected to you, uh, even, yeah. even when you're not there. That's part of what yeah, I hear yeah, in that yeah. story, right? That's right. Yeah, I mean, I'm far away geographically. Yeah, he, your dad doesn't have to respond like that. You would never know. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Hey, let me just ask you one more question about your parents, because I know Australia had all those insane fires. Yeah. Are they? Did it come near them, uh, and are they okay? No, they're, they're fine. Thank. I appreciate your asking. The, the worst fires in, in recorded history, all on the East Coast, and we're about 3,000 miles away. So my family was safe. My uncle was getting closer to them, but never in danger. But what's interesting, you know, Australia is so spread out that the human loss of life was actually relatively low. And it's the, the fauna, the animals that got decimated. Yeah, I read and I, you know, what do I know? I don't know that it's even real, but I read hundreds of millions of animals just wiped out. Yeah, they're estimating half a billion to a billion animals. And I think still getting their mind around it. And the real issue is some of these little minuscule marsupials that are endangered, you know, hoping that we haven't lost an entire species. It's, it's unbelievable. A big deal. Yeah. yeah, it's a big deal. Yeah, we're, we're definitely in some sort of a cultural moment. We're experiencing global pandemic and then even things like fires in Australia. We're in some sort of just feels like a global upheaval in many ways. Uh, and maybe we'll come back to that at the end of our podcast. I have a couple questions for you. Uh, hey, this is what I'd like to do if we could. I'd like to pivot here just for a moment, Steve. And I want to talk to you about your book. And I, I just want to begin with maybe letting you riff for a moment and share with us just some stuff about leadership and maybe healthy leadership. So I, I would love for you to maybe outline a little bit for us, what are some of the dynamics of a healthy leader? And then maybe what are some of the dynamics of a healthy team? Yeah, Because I, that was part of what I was big picking questions. up in your... That was part of what I was picking up in your book is like, it's, this is not just about being a healthy leader, but this is about, in some ways, engendering a healthy team culture. 
Oh, those are huge questions. So, okay. So I think a healthy leader and a healthy team probably have a similar answer. I, I think a healthy leader is not somebody who's healthy. It's someone who's pursuing health. So I think it's helpful for people to know, I don't think you ever graduate and then become a healthy leader. Mm -hmm. I think it's just that you are in the continual pursuit of health. And to me, that would be defined by two core traits. One would be that you're a fully integrated person or that you're working on integration, that your emotions and your intellect are integrated and that you are as aware of what's going on under the surface of what you do as you are of what you do. So, you know, a lot of what I write about in the book is how do you actually tap what's going on under the surface in your life? Because it is infecting your leadership, whether you think it is or not. I do a podcast too, and I ask every guest a set of questions at the end of the interview. It's what I playfully call it my gauntlet of anxiety questions. And I've just had a couple of times where a guest is not aware that they're anxious. I'll, I'll say to them, how do you know when you're anxious? And they'll say, oh, I'm not an anxious person. Because what they mean is I'm, I'm not generally afraid of much and I don't seem to worry much. And, then I'll, I, and I'm never in, interested in like exposing a guest or putting them on the spot, but I'll just say, well, you know, what is your spouse if they're married? <laughs> <laughs> How does your spouse know when you're anxious? Yeah, to and the then core. Kinda, yeah, then they'll give me a look. No. Uh, because, you know, my youngest child's now 13, but she could tell me clearly when I was anxious when she was nine. Clearly. She knew. She just knew. Because everybody knows uh, when your shadow side shows up. So that would be the second side of a healthy leader is you are mindful of the negative impact of your actions on others and you're able to do repair and to work on the negative impact. So I think therefore a healthy team is one where everybody is aware of what's bubbling under the surface in each other and everybody both at the same time has grace for the impact of another but also holds them to account for it. Yeah. And so like in my case I'm the lead pastor in my church. I'm I'm the boss of all, but I have key leaders who can come to me and say, "Hey, you're not you're not well right now. I'm noticing you're doing that thing again." And sometimes I'll be combative in the moment. I'll be defensive. But I'm, I, I've done this enough to go back and be able to say thank you and do repair. Uh, and so it's not about suddenly becoming like some kind of Yoda, you know, where yeah. you're the guru. It's, it's I think you've created um, a culture where people can come as their full integrated selves and then they can, you can also help each other move toward health. Yeah, so part of what I hear you saying there is, a healthy leader and a healthy team are both growing in some very specific kinds of self-awareness. Yeah, for sure. And, and self-awareness is a hot topic right now. So yes, self-awareness is a good start. But I think we also know people who are self-aware. And uh, I believe that the appropriate podcast vocabulary is they're jerks about <laughs> it. They're just, yes. right? They're, they're self-aware, but no one actually still wants to be around them because they don't give a damn. Yeah, so I'm aware of myself, but I just give myself a pass. You have to deal with it. That's the way I am. So I, I think actually the journey is that you're hungry for transformation. You actually want the Spirit of Christ to invade your life, do some difficult work in areas of pain and shadow in your life, so that your self-awareness now becomes the gate to transformation. It's not the end. So, you know, I think every one of us knows somebody who, who'll say something like, well, I just tell it the way it is. Yeah, and, and you're like, no, you don't. You don't tell it the way it is. You tell a highly subjective version of reality. You actually are so wrapped up in the story you're telling yourself that none of us can get in and actually help you break free. You're actually a slave to telling it the way it is. That's a self-aware person that isn't interested in transformation. At that's all. right. Well, that's a great distinction. I know that I've experienced some of these even very similar conversations with people who first encounter like the Enneagram or something. And so for myself, I'm an Enneagram 8, you know, who by nature tells it like it is, right? Right. But what I hear in what you're saying is, if I, and I'm just make this personal, if I'm not interested in personal transformation, if I'm not interested in the impact that I'm always having on the room or my family or my staff, well, then what's the point of even that first little bit of self-knowledge? That's right. It's, and the Enneagram is a good example because I do think there are so many people today who are an absolute gift to kingdom leaders with their Enneagram knowledge. It's, it really is, I think, a very powerful tool. 
but it's it's like any other tool it's it's a power tool and if you don't know how to use it you will do damage yeah. and it, it that the way people use the enneagram some people are using it as a pathway into transformation and a deeper encounter with christ and a lot of people are using it to hide behind well in, in you know in your case well i'm an eight what do you this is Deal my gift it. to the kingdom yeah, yeah. and, and I, i've seen it with uh entrepreneurial type a uh distracted leaders where they get bored and so they blow something up so they can uh, be the hero to rescue it. And they'll say, well, you know, that's just the price we all have to pay for my entrepreneurial gift. Mm. And I would just say as a leader, that's a bunch of crap. That's absolute crap. You can be entrepreneurial, type A and driven. And also be aware of how your the shadow side of that gift negatively impacts your organization and how you can actually grow in maturity as a leader uh so yeah i you know self-awareness is great without it we're all narcissists but only with it we're all self-absorbed and i think i'm casting a vision for something way beyond that i think you are too um and even in this the little little story that you just told there about a you know type a driven entrepreneurial leader without some of this deeper self-knowledge and a commitment to change then the people in the organization or the people on the team who have maybe like high responsibility, who feel responsible for things, we, we're just completely unaware that we're destroying those people all the time with our, you know, next thing, next thing, blow it up, next thing, next thing. One of the things that was happening on my staff, and I wasn't aware of this for years, is that I had two people who were really high in like gifts of empathy, but specifically responsibility. And I'm an external processor. So I can't even know if I like an idea until I talk about it as a team. So I'm yeah. sharing things with my team. These are literally just ideas that I'm not even committed to, but I have these two people on my staff who are hearing me say, Adam wants us to start working on these now. But I totally didn't, right? Yeah, that's a brilliant example because you're aware that you're an external processor. That means that you say ideas that you don't necessarily care about. But as an eight, you sound like you care passionately about them. <laughs> Plus also, whatever your role, if you're their leader, all that authority is coming through your voice as well. And uh, yeah, if you're not aware of that, man, you can be exacerbating a really good group of people. That's right. That's great. And uh, I, and I'm I'm only now beginning to do work on that, but I am learning to qualify external processing sessions as no one here has to do anything right now. We're just yeah. we're just spitballing. I'm having fun, like you know. Yep. Let's just that's, like, that's let's a put great it down. example. Yeah, you're just saying, hey, this this really serves and helps. It's help. It's actually a vulnerable moment. I wish I was the kind of person that was more thoughtful, but I'm not. If you wouldn't mind just indulging me as I riff, that would be really helpful for me. Yeah, because what I also because I'm the same way. I'm at Enneagram three. What I know is true is our church wouldn't have gotten to where we are without that gift that I bring. I'm very nimble. I usually have eighty ideas, and maybe ten percent of them are good. Maybe <laughs> you know, yeah, same. Uh, yeah, and so what's what's true is we wouldn't be the church we are if it wasn't for my gift. But what's interesting is I've been here fourteen years now. And I'm trying to find my new place as the leader because we don't, our church does not require that entrepreneurial nimble gift. In fact, if I'm not careful, it's a massive detriment. But just recently, one of my best leaders came to our executive pastor and me, to Tom and I, and he said, look, we are in a season of chaos. Like, and what, what he was great about, he wasn't blaming, he wasn't saying, and it's because of you. That's right. <laughs> because the executive pastor and I are both idea generators, and yes to all leaders. That's great. Let's do it. That's great. Let's do it. And this guy's saying, look, the yes to all leadership style is exhausting good people. Let me show you how many hours my people are setting up chairs and tables for the things you're saying yes to. Brilliant. And, and I'm not the kind of person that wants to exacerbate a staff. And I'm also aware that there's a limit to my gift. And it's interesting. I'm, I'm in a little bit of a... Um, what would you call it? Like a, a social, an angst right now. How can I bring my best contribution to this church? Because it's not that anymore. You know, mm -hmm. if I keep doing that thing, it's going to exhaust good people. We actually are in a season of where we need more stability. It's really interesting. Well, you know what I hear and what you're saying there too is, I see what you're saying as in some ways overlapping with 
uh, maybe the the age and the growth dynamic of a church. Whereas maybe if you're a church planter or the church is young, what it really does need is it needs ideation. It needs fresh vigor. It needs new thought. Let's try stuff. Like let's try lots of things to find yeah. out which ones work. But then you know, if the church is 14 years old, it's got some stability. Families are there. You're baptizing kids. You got mom and dad. Friends are bringing friends. You have a building. Now, all of a sudden, the organizational side of what your church needs is maybe very different, and it requires you to change your role a little bit or to change That's the right. way you act in the system. Is that what I'm hearing you say? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And and then it becomes a matter of calling. Okay. Is, is God calling? Because I believe God's calling me to stay at this church. I have tremendous passion and lots of vision left for where we need to go. But then you have to decide, okay, is God's call that I'm the kind of person that should be starting things and then handing them off? Or is God calling me to mature and develop as a leader? And I'm pretty sure it's the second. It's a lot more painful personally. I, I feel out of my zone right now. Because the other thing that's interesting, so many of our, my key leaders have so much vision for what we're doing. They're generating great vision. And I just need to be their cheerleader, not the driver. Well, let me ask you another question that's deeply connected to your book. If I understand your book right, and you can correct me here, but if I understand your book right, it's kind of like a family systems approach to anxiety and leadership. Yeah. And I think some of those terms would be really new for a lot of the people who are listening to this podcast. I would love it if you would just maybe sort of outline what is family systems or how would you describe that just so that we can kind of like catch some people up into what to expect in your book. Yeah. Yep. Okay, great. So it, it's pretty simple. I, I believe that one of the primary things that God loves to do with a human is transform us and make us free from whatever we are tightly holding onto or whatever has us in its grip. I think there's a strong theology of bondage and freedom all through scripture. And I think the other thing God is interested in is us as a people experiencing profound peace, you know, shalom in the Old Testament all the way through. I also think what gets interesting is psychotherapy generally has those same goals. They want people to be transformed. They want peace. The difference is in the kingdom, the end result is worship. And I think that's what we're after as people is more worship of God, the king. So I just study psychological principles that have alignment with the kingdom values. Uh, when I was a hospital chaplain, I had the incredible privilege of being trained under one of the people who was a family systems theory student, he was actually trained by the founder of family systems theory. So people understand psychology, Freud and Jung and all of that stuff. Systems theory has, has two simple ideas that are profound for Christians. The first idea is problems aren't just generated inside us. They're also generated between us. 
And that's not radical today, but it was radical in 1954 when it was founded. Murray Bowen is the founder of family systems theory, and he was paying attention to his paranoid schizophrenic patients in a psych ward. Bowen's a psychiatrist. And he was just working through the lens of medicine and Jungian theory when he started to notice the way that these schizophrenic patients would relate to their parents on visitation day. And that's when the light bulb went on for Bowen, where he's like, okay, wait a minute. The problem isn't just inside Mm. these guys. The problem is also the way they relate to their parents. So systems theory was born and he came up with eight basic concepts. And we won't cover all eight today, but one of the basic concepts was understanding the nature of chronic anxiety. That's the second big idea. So if the first big idea is problems aren't just inside us, they're between us. The second big idea is if you can understand the nature of chronic anxiety, what it is, when it shows up, and how to move through it, you can experience that transformation that Jesus offers us. You can experience the peace of Christ that passes understanding. And chronic anxiety is a very specific form of anxiety. It's not PTSD and it's not generalized anxiety disorder. Chronic anxiety shows up anytime a human being doesn't get what they think they need that they don't really need. So chronic anxiety is generated as a response to a false need. We think we need something to survive and be okay, but we really don't. So a classic example for me is one of the things I believe I need in my life is to always have the answer at the ready. If somebody asks me a question, it's very, very difficult for me to say, I don't know. Sure. We can go into why I had that need. And for me, it's deeply tied to always feeling stupid as a kid. I just always felt like the dumb kid. So I overcompensate because that's a terrible feeling. Every time I feel stupid, I feel exposed. Like the whole classroom knows I'm stupid. I then go into shame. So it's a very technical thing. But what that looks like as a leader, now I'm a lead pastor and I have this weird false need that I need to always know the answer. You imagine what it's like to, for example, be in a staff meeting, a staff member. Maybe they ask me, how long are we going to be in lockdown with the virus? That's right. Now, the correct answer is, I don't know. (laughs) That's the correct answer. Nobody knows. But I have this false need to know. Then where things get really interesting is if a leader can start to identify, okay, what is something that I think I need that I don't really need? Okay, what do I do next to mitigate that need? And that's why chronic anxiety doesn't have a whole lot to do with worry and fear. It has to do with how you show up in a group to get what you need that you don't really need. So I'll I'll exaggerate. I'll riff. I'll try to answer. But if I'm aware going into a meeting, oh man, I'm the kind of person that thinks I need to know, I can actually die to that need before I go in the meeting. I've done this so many times. I'll say, you know what, Lord? Jesus died to free me from needing to know the answer. I can sit in that meeting and I can say, I don't know, and my identity is in Christ. It's not in looking impressive. Yeah, And that would just be kind of a blow by blow. Every leader has somewhere between eight and 50 false needs that we think we need that we don't really need. Wow. And the more you can name them concretely, another need for my, of mine that I identified this one maybe 10 years ago so I've been, I've been doing this work now 25 years. So I was 15 years into doing this work where I identified this need. I believe every sermon must be gold standard for me to be okay. And suddenly I realize that's unsustainable. And then when I start to work on, okay, well, what happens when I live out of that need? I'm now putting pressure on my wife to tell me that the sermon was amazing and on and on it goes. I think what's helpful is if a leader can identify as concretely as possible their needs. Even just saying, I need to know the answer, getting as specific as you can. So with preaching, it helped me to name, I believe that I need every sermon to be gold standard every time. I think that act of saying that out loud Mm. to another person is what the Bible calls confession. So I think even if you just think it in your head, you're not as free from it as if you get someone you trust or someone who's safe and you say, I need to confess something to you right now. I've discovered in my life that I'm operating out of a false belief that's generating anxiety in my life. Because what would happen for me is if I'd preach a, a sermon that I didn't think was very good, I'd be all bent out of shape. 
But worse yet, if I preached a sermon that I thought was really good, yeah. I'd put myself under so much pressure to top it the next week. And I'm no longer proclaiming the gospel. I'm, I'm playing a whole other game. Yeah, your ability to name what you need and then your ability to write down or to say to somebody the impact of that behavior, that's when you can start to transform. Yeah, and isn't it interesting, because you just sort of labeled it as confession, and isn't it interesting that the Bible says that if you confess your sins to God, you'll be forgiven, but if you confess your sins to a brother, you get healed? Yeah, that's right. It's really interesting. I, I love the way you just sort of framed that. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm all for Martin Luther. Reformation's cool, but we owe the Catholics with confession. Us Protestants have lost something great with verbal external co confession, for sure. I'm also wondering, too, just as you're talking about naming unmet needs, things you thought you needed but you really didn't, is this connected to that section in your book where you're talking about childhood vows? Yeah, so a childhood vow is one of the deepest forms of the work of uncovering these needs. So you can just begin by just trying to pay attention to what you believe you need that you don't really need. But a childhood vow is one of the deepest plunges you can take. And a childhood vow is simply, it's an inciting incident that happened when you were a kid that was painful. You have then made some kind of secret agreement with yourself. And it's usually an overt agreement where you know about it, or it's a subconscious agreement, you're not aware of it. And instead of living by faith, anytime you're under pressure or exhausted or feeling attacked, you end up depending on your childhood vow instead of on God. So in my, in my life, I grew up with a pretty angry dad. He did a lot of yelling. And so I, I made a vow. I am never going to let somebody know that I'm angry at them because I don't like the way it feels when someone lets me know that. Now, that's a completely unsustainable vow. But whenever I'm under pressure or early in marriage, for example, that for my wife, the work that my wife had to do to get me to admit that she had done something to hurt me or that I was angry was just off the charts. But that vow is keeping me bound. It, a, a friend of mine, he was raised by a violent alcoholic. And he's public about this. He, he says that the, he made a vow where he became hyper aware of how to make sure no one ever explodes. So you imagine him as a pastor now walking into a room feeling this crazy pressure to keep the peace. The way he would say it is, that vow literally made him survive childhood. He may have actually been killed by his violent dad as a kid. If he didn't learn how to protect his mom and appease his dad, his point is, but, but it strangles you as an adult. You know, it's like still trying to put on yeah. clothes as a kid. You just can't fit in them anymore. So yeah, well, I do a whole chapter on childhood vows. I'm, I'm mostly indebted to a guy named Jim Harrington and a lady named Trisha Taylor. Uh, I use quite a bit of their material with their permission. People can Google them and, yeah. and find this stuff, but that's a childhood vow. Yeah, it, it's interesting. That was one of the most useful chapters for our staff, even, in terms of just bringing new levels of awareness of who we are as people and then how we work together and then even just how we show up together as a staff. And just for me personally, I, I had a really hard time identifying any childhood vows yeah. at the beginning, and it took me over a week. It took me probably two weeks before things began to surface. Yeah. And then it was like the, you know, the switch flipped, and then I became very aware of one of my most core childhood vows, which was, "Everything depends on you. No one will help you." Yeah. And then I then I began to realize, oh my goodness, here I am. I'm a 41, almost 42 year old man, and I've lived with this really untrue idea that that everything is up to me. You know, and I, and no wonder I carry everything. I've always been a person with too many jobs. Uh, doing too many things and fairly, fairly fatigued, not just in my body, but in my soul. And so being able to name that, I'm, I'm not all the way through it, but at least I can name it. And I'm able to see this is how I operate when I get stressed or when anxiety comes into the system. I just want to take control. I'll just take control. It's easier. I can do it. And it's all up to me. It's a really great example, Adam, because first of all, if it only took you a week or two, that would be pretty quick work. Um, I, okay. I thought it was, I thought that was long. I thought that was, I, I felt, I felt deficient in that yeah. way. Um, most people like the, when we teach childhood vows at our church, the most common response I get is people say, I'm sure it's true. And I'm sure I have one. I have no idea what it is. And it does, it just takes some time. 
But the other reason I like your example is because one of the ways that you can notice a childhood vow is you have to listen to your self-talk and you're listening for superlatives and you use two superlatives. Everything, I don't remember the second one now, but you, I, I picked up two superlatives when you said your vow. Everything depends on me. No one will help. No one. That was the other one. And so superlatives and exaggeration and musts and shoulds and oughts are all good indicators that you're living under a vow. And then the next step is you can now try to compare it to the good news. Like this, the way you know that chronic anxiety has you in its grip is it always leads you down a path of bad news, less peace, less freedom, more anxiety. Like, so my chronic anxiety traditionally shows up in a spinning mind. I believe the lie that I can worry my way to peace, but Anxiety, if you indulge it, only ever leads to more anxiety. And so what we need is the gospel of Jesus to literally displace and cast out our anxiety. And so doing childhood vow work, you, you identify it, and then you actually write down the impact of your behavior when you've been living out of that vow. And then you just, comp- I, what I do is compare it to scripture. I go hunt scripture for what's true. And then the way I live by faith because I think when we talk about living by faith, it, it feels so ambiguous. But living by faith for me is as simple as, am I going to believe my self-narrative or am I going to believe the gospel of Jesus? And they're almost always in competition with each other. So your belief that it's always on you is in direct competition with the gospel, which is it's always on God. And so you now have a decision to make. And to me, it's a daily decision. And so if I was in your shoes, Adam, or if I was coaching you, I would just say, okay, set your stopwatch for about three years. That's about, if with, with daily practice, it'll take about three years for that vow to dissolve its grip on you. Wow. And so now you've got three years where you have to be very kind to yourself because you've been living out of that vow for about 40 years. And that vow yeah, that's right. It, My- it's been a constant companion. It's gotten you through some tough times. It's gotten you probably very productive. It's probably had people affirm you oh wow adam man he we well, can count on adam that kind of stuff well and that's that's been part of the the revelation for me beyond the childhood vow has been all the ways in which i've been affirmed by it yeah people look at me and go oh adam's really high capacity boy this if we need something done let's count on adam and then you take that as that's part right. of your identity and that's where it gets really tricky is sometimes people will do this work and they'll say, oh man, if I do all this work, am I just going to be some kind of a hippie who lays around in a hot tub the whole time smoking weed? You know? And I was, yeah, maybe, yeah, maybe. <laughs> but, but more likely, you will still be productive. Like, for example, my vow about gold standard sermons, I still have a genuine drive to preach the best sermon I can every week because I believe that, that that's glorifying to God. The difference is I'm not in the grip of it anymore. That's the thing is like you will still be a productive person. You'll still be a very responsible person when you've gone through all this, but you will no longer be in its death grip. It'll now become a tool that you can offer the kingdom rather than something that has you in a squeeze.
Well, yeah, if I can just be a little more self-confessional here, one of the things I've started to do, and I'm, I'm, I'm talking about literally in the last month, as a result of this, I have taken one of my email accounts off my phone, Good. and I'm starting to leave my main computer at work because I would go home and, you know, it'd be family time. And after dinner or something, I would look at that one computer that has some very important email stuff in it. And if there was something in there that I felt like needed attention, I would just get on it. And the next thing you know, it's, it's 8 p.m. and I'm doing things I, I have no business doing at that moment. Yeah. How long did it take to stop feeling like naughty leaving the computer at work? Well, I still do. Yeah. You know, I still do. I still feel the the emotional resonance of it is still with me. But I do know that, you know, I'm trying to lean into the idea, to use your phrase, you know, it doesn't all depend on me. It actually does depend on God. And because of that, I can have some margins. But yeah, you know, I leave my, my computer at work and I still feel, wow, is I this should okay? take it home. Yeah, that's, that's really good <laughs> yeah. work. Yeah. Take about three years yeah. is my experience. And and, you know, there's a couple of hacks you can do to speed things up. So, like, you could study Sabbath through the lens of control, not through the lens of rest. There's a whole theology of Sabbath that's, li- you might know this, Adam, but that's linked to letting go of control as much as it's linked to getting rest. And then the better hack, this is a family systems tool, is you have to find ways to be irresponsible and not tell anybody. Uh, <laughs> And and not tell you anyone. Can't, no, if you tell people, that's not going to work. You can't tell your team, hey, I'm going to drop a ball and let you down. Just want you to know I'm working. Oh, you just have yeah, to drop it. a ball and let them down. So what I did six, seven years ago, I intentionally got up and preached a really bad sermon at my church. It was just really bad to break this vow, to break this thing. And I couldn't tell anybody that I'd done it. Like I couldn't say, hey, I'm doing some inner work to help me I just have to get up, I have to preach badly, and then I have to take compliments when people say, thank you, that was so good. Oh my gosh. And I can't say to them, hey, I was actually, it wasn't very good this week. And I tell you what, that's what, because God God is as mischievous as we think he is, is you preach a bad sermon and then someone says, boy, God really did something today through your words that I needed. Well, isn't isn't that funny? Because especially back when I was, in my worship leader days, on the Sundays where things were a train wreck, I would invariably meet people who, who would come to me afterwards and, and tell me, that was amazing. Yeah, that's right. And, and I'm thinking, I am so ashamed and embarrassed right that's now. That's right. Yeah. That's so great. yeah, if you, can, well, if you can find a way to be irresponsible, I, I wouldn't do it where you get the police are involved. Like I wouldn't do that. But, that's right. But something where you have to be irresponsible. Uh, I, I had a student recently in my class, we do this as a class. And he had that same kind of vow you have, strong inner critic. And he's an intern in our church. So he has no power whatsoever. And his vow is around making mistakes and getting it wrong. He believes the lie that he has to get it right the first time, every time. Tremendous pressure. So we did this little hack. We're like, all right, this week, make a whopper mistake and don't tell your boss. You can't tell your boss, hey, your boss told me to make a mistake. (laughs) <laughs> right? So, I so love this. To his great credit, he was he was game. He's like, all right. And he and we're like, how did it go? The next week, you know, we gather every two weeks. Hey, we're all excited. How did the mistake go? He's like, it was a real letdown because she didn't even tell me off. Oh, he man. actually would have felt better if she had laid into him. And he's like, mm. I can't, like, I make this mistake. I do it intentionally. I'm all ready to hear from her how it looked. And it involved church budget and spending too much of the church money on a, on a thing. And he's ready to take her like, hey, listen, like he was, he had already planned that she would say, listen, this is God's money. This is people's donation. You have to be more careful. I, I know you're an intern, but this is how you learn. He's like, she didn't even phase her. Like, I was so disappointed mm. because in his mind, she's a hard taskmaster. And of course, mm. I happen to know this leader. She's an incredibly gracious person and... But that's that's a yeah. that's a way to speed up the transformation process is actually intentionally do the very thing you're terrified of doing. Mm. Yeah. So so you're saying I should still pay my taxes? I I can neither confirm nor deny. You know, <laughs> you should uh, uh, consult an attorney and so on. <laughs> yes. Yes. Well, that's uh, that's great. I'm I'm actually going to do that, and uh, I won't tell anyone on my staff or anyone that I'm responsible Well, and if to, your staff, that's for if sure. they're listening to this podcast, just to... Yeah, that's the problem. Well, no, it's not. They they might ask you, but you can't tell them. 
So oh, that's right. You might okay. have to gotcha. let them down several times. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. All right. Well, I just want to ask a couple more questions because I don't want to steal your whole yep. day. Let me just ask you this. Reading through the book, one of the things that I began to notice is that if we implement more of what you're talking about, more of this family systems approach to dealing with our own internal anxiety and our team dynamics, I noticed that it's probably going to create a culture in our team that has more feedback or a culture that is able to handle more feedback. Is is that something that you would agree with? Yeah. Is that kind of part of what happens? Yeah, I think what it does is it raises to the surface things that everybody already knows, but no one was talking about before. And so that's true. There is that level of feedback and, and it can feel a bit confrontive at first. So for your listeners right now, everybody listening to this podcast who's on some kind of a team already knows the following groups of people on your team. Who always speaks up first? It's always the same person. Who always has the last word? Who never speaks up in a meeting unless they're called upon? Now, all of your listeners already have people in mind. The, the final question yeah. is the most fun. Who on your team has the meeting after the meeting? They don't talk up in the meeting because <laughs> they're not direct communicators. <laughs> what they do is they wait yeah. and they basically freaking gossip out in the hallway. They have their own meeting after the meeting. Now, every yeah. one of your listeners already knows who it is. All I'm saying is, what would it look like in your organization to speak at that level? To say... Yes. Hey, I've noticed this dynamic between you and I, and here's what it is. Now, this kind of conversation never works if you're having the conversation out of a place of blame. The reason I love family systems theory, it has no interest in blame. It could care less about blame. Even when you get into like genograms and family tree stuff, it's not looking to blame dad. It's, it's actually giving you more responsibility. So when I have these conversations, they always have to start with confession. Hey, I've noticed that we have this dynamic between us and I don't know what to do about it. Here's what I think I'm doing that makes it worse. Would you tell me what you think I'm doing? Okay, mm. here's what I think you're doing that I'm confused about. And, it's, and it, because it's vulnerable, people are going to get defensive. But if you can be a, a calm presence through it, you can change years of dynamics in weeks by using this technique. Yeah, I, lo I love that. And I remember even from your book, there's a small Seth Godin quote in there where you quote him and he says, it might not be your fault, but it probably is your responsibility. That's right. Talking about basically what's happened to you in life. And I think part of what I love about a lot of this approach is, yeah, maybe there's some things that have happened to me in my life. Maybe some stuff happened to me with my family, or maybe some stuff is happening to me on the church team that I'm a part of. And maybe it's not my fault, but maybe maybe there is an aspect of, that is my responsibility, at least how I show up in it. Am I hearing that right? That's right. Yeah. One of the kind of 2.0 family systems theorists, his name is Ed Friedman. He's probably the most famous systems theorist in church leadership. His parents survived Auschwitz. So he has no tolerance for victim mentality in any of his writing. And you'll see this theme. Like he doesn't care what happened to you only how it impacts your team and how you can now have the power to overcome it. And I, I think that is the gift of systems theory is that it actually gives you the freedom to take responsibility and to not blame your people. Like most of the dynamics that are bad in my team, I have responsibility for because I'm the number one leader. So I have the most power to make things better and I have the most power to cause damage. And it's unbelievably humbling how much my emotional health uh, factors our team's health. It's really disturbing, but that's reality. Yeah. Well, let me just ask you two more questions here. Number one, we've already sort of referenced this a little bit. Clearly, we're living in really strange times. It's a global pandemic. Anxiety is, in my estimation, up uh, for a lot <laughs> yeah, of people. I'd say so. And yeah. I know a lot of the pastors and worship leaders I'm talking to, you know, we're all kind of scrambling, trying to figure out how do we keep being the church? How do we stay connected? You know, so many things. I I'm just wondering, what would you like to say to pastors and leaders and worship leaders who are trying to lead in this kind of a moment? Yeah. So one of the concepts in systems theory is called societal regression. If anxiety happens between us, the, the big idea is that anxiety is always contagious in a group. Y again, your, your folks can notice it. Just look at your staff watch someone get anxious on your staff, 
and then watch all your staff catch that anxiety the way you catch a cold. So anxiety is always contagious in a group unless there's a, a non-anxious leader or a differentiated leader in the room. So Murray Bowen, the founder of Systems Theory, he just took that concept and put it on an entire society. And he says, same, same idea. Anxiety is contagious in a society. We catch each other's. The more anxious the society's leader is, the more anxious the society is. Regardless of your political persuasion, I don't care if you're a Republican or a Democrat, we have an extremely highly anxious president. We always have. That's right. And you can see at every press conference, he's just anxious and he is full of shame. He carries unbelievable levels of shame that he doesn't know what to do with. And it's turned into, in my opinion, pretty pathological narcissism. And once again, Democrat or Republican, I don't care. So we are being led by an anxious leader. And then social media is one of the fastest ways that anxiety can get caught in any system because we're shrinking each other down to two-dimensional objects rather than human beings. So here's what I would say is we need non-anxious, calm leadership more than ever. We need it at a local level because we're not getting it federally. Now we are like Anthony Fucci, the doctor, he would be a phenomenal example of a calm presence. In our state, our governor, uh, Jared Polis, is doing an incredible job of being a calm presence. And I wish I had a Republican governor so people wouldn't be listening to us thinking I'm I'm anti-Republican. I assure you I'm not. Um, yes. But um, so we need we need our local leaders to be calm presence. And that means that our worship leaders and our pastors, we need to spend time figuring out how do you know when you're not OK? Because most leaders don't actually know when we're not OK. The people around us know, but we don't know. We're often the last to know. So I would say, first of all, we can do more work on understanding when we're anxious. Some of the work you and I have been covering. But the second, yeah. the second thing, Adam, I think is let's just put things in perspective. So, you know, a lot of us are scrambling to figure out how do we deliver our worship services in a way that is meaningful to people in their living rooms. That's a real issue. And we're putting a lot of effort into that. But why don't you just, instead of that, why don't you just call a doctor in your church this week? Call somebody who has to suit up and call a city leader, somebody who is leading your city. And just ask them how they're doing and how you can pray for them. And that'll just help you put in perspective the level of importance. So for example, our team has also done a lot of work getting our, we're not an online church and now we are, you know, we've scrambled as well. But two days ago, I called a doctor in my church. She does nothing but coronavirus diagnoses. That's her whole job right now. She's in an intensive care ward. And I'm just chatting to her. How can I pray for you? And she's saying, look, first of all, when I'm suiting up in all this gear and I'm three or four layers thick in protective gear, she's saying, could you pray for me? How do I help be a calm presence to that patient when I look like a space astronaut? You know, like it just, just the physicality. And then she says, right. and, and would you just pray that I'm protected when I go home to my young kids? Yeah. Now that suddenly makes me realize, you know what? Church online crashing, Facebook live crashing, it just doesn't matter as much. And this is an opportunity for our church leaders to go back to old-fashioned pastoring of our people, some of whom are in a life or death. Uh, We have a a key leader in our local rescue mission, and he and I are on the phone once a week and just sharing burdens. He's saying, how do I feed 1,500 people a day when all my volunteers have disappeared? Mm. And I think this is a time for us to get real clear on what really matters and what doesn't. And, and then the other thing is, uh, I, I feel like I'm on a bit of a rant, so just jump in if I'm... No, it's just great. I, I love this. Uh, I love this. Richard Beck wrote a book called Slavery to Death, and I plan on referencing his ideas in my Easter Sunday sermon. Beck says that in the Western church, we focus on Romans, where Paul says that sin leads to death. He said, but in the Eastern Orthodox church, they focus on Genesis 3, death leads to sin. And, and Richard Beck's idea is everything that we are doing, all of our sin and anxiety, is because we're afraid of death. And I do think this is an opportunity for followers of Jesus to remember the words of Paul, to live as Christ and to die as gain. I think because we live in a prosperous, healthy culture, we live in a Western culture where we're used to being in control, all of that's being stripped away from us. And I think up until this moment, we were saying to live a very long life is gain and then to die as Christ. We might die. 
Like, I don't mean to be flippant about it, but some of us might no. die. And that, according to scripture, that's gain. And we have to decide, does Paul know what he's talking about? Or does our culture know what we're talking about? I think there's an incredible opportunity for the gospel to remind people that death does not have to be the end of your story. You can be folded into the grand narrative of God where eternal life begins the day you accept Christ. You know, and, and uh, I just think, I think the, the outcome of a healthy, prosperous, control-based society is we want the longest possible life for everyone in our life. And of course we do. Yeah. That's not bad. I, if you want that, that's not a bad thing to want. But there is better news than that, which is abiding in Christ in eternity. That's right. And long life is not the same thing as meaningful. Yeah. Yeah, but but of course you in know, our culture we want a long meaningful life. <laughs> like we want it all. We yeah, want it course. all. We want it yeah, all, don't yeah, we? Yeah. We want it all. Well, hey, that's really great wisdom. Thank you, Steve. Yeah, you bet. Hey, let me ask you one more question and this is the the question we ask everyone on the podcast when we finish up. I'm just very interested in what you're dreaming about these days. What's the dream that's alive in your heart? Yeah, so our church has a passion to give half our resources and half our property away to the poor. And it's a big, audacious dream. We're 10% of the way there, and we just need more resource. And so I'm, I'm dreaming about how can we, sp- it feels like we're on a 20-year journey, and I'm impatient. How can we make it a seven-year journey? That's what I'm dreaming about for our church, because we're in a wealthy city that, as a general rule, we export our poor to get help. And our church wants to be one of the churches in our city where people on the margins know they can come to our church, regardless of what they believe to get systemic help. And so we, we, we have no interest in charity as a church. We're all about breaking the systems and structures of poverty. So I'm dreaming about that. Then on a personal level, I'm dreaming about how to turn this book I wrote into a daily devotional theological book for everyday people. Because it really is, the reason it's a leadership book is because it was published by this amazing leadership group who took a chance on someone that no one's ever heard of before. But I'd love to figure out how to Well, I I want to write a biblical narrative. I'm working on some ideas about legalism right now. Uh, We always talk about legalism as this thing that's outside of us. We always describe it as those people over there are legalistic. So I'm wanting to look at how is legalism inside of us? How are we all actually closet legalists? Uh, Even with the Enneagram, for example, because we're all legalists, we're just taking the Enneagram, we're using it as legalism against people. You know, there would be many examples. So I'm yeah, trying to figure totally. out how to carve out time to write some of that work. Oh, that's wonderful. I, I love the energy and the passion that you speak with. So I can tell that this is truly alive in your heart. Yeah, yeah. It's some of my favorite work I do for sure. Yeah. Well, Steve, I just want to say thank you for coming and sharing your heart and your ministry with us. This is all very helpful. This is going to help a lot of people. So just thanks for giving us an hour of your day. You bet, Adam. Thanks for having me on the show. That's right. All right, everybody, if you're listening and this was helpful to you, I just encourage you to go and get Steve's book. It's called Managing Leadership Anxiety, Yours and Theirs, and it's just great. All right, everyone, peace. Hey everyone, Casey Quorum here, producer of the podcast. Thanks for listening. I just wanted to remind you of a couple things. First of all, check out Cherry Blossoms, our new single, wherever you listen to music. Also join us on YouTube and Facebook Live, Sunday through Friday at 10 a.m. Eastern for our Vineyard Worship Together daily worship stream. All right, people, stay safe. Peace.